Well, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our forum today is our quarterly fo folio update. Today's session, like all folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all the questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the question, or the speaker will address the question at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Harry Kaplanian, Senior Director of Product Management and Software Services at EBSCO. So with that, I'll turn it over to Harry. And Harry, you're muted. Hello, everyone. Um, as Eric mentioned, uh, my name is Harry. Um, my major purpose for at least my role on Folio is really to help facilitate the community in the creation of a roadmap and really to help organize and help the community come up with an overall plan. Um, the priorities for the Folio project are really fully developed and provided by the community itself. And uh, again, I'm just here to help. So. Um, just briefly, um, we'll talk about some of the benefits of Folio, and then I intend on um, showing you some of the process in terms of how we come up with these priorities, and then give a demonstration, and uh, ideally open it up for questions as well. And here we go. So from the perspective of a platform, and Folio first and foremost really is a platform, um, it really brings three key advantages to the market. And one of that is this open innovation business model. Um, Folio is open source through and through um, under the Apache 2 license. And what that means is libraries are not locked into a single vendor. Today, if you go with a vendor, you select a system, if at some point in time you decide you're not happy with that vendor, what that means is to switch, you have to switch systems as well, which means a full-on migration. With Folio, ideally, that doesn't need to happen any longer because of the code, the applications, everything is out there is freely available. Um, there are multiple vendors that will be servicing it, and there are also a large number of libraries that intend on fully hosting this themselves, so vendor lists, in a sense. Folio itself is based on this concept of a microservice architecture. Um, traditionally, these systems are built really in a monolithic manner, which means over time they gain complexity. Over time, it becomes harder and harder to change. I'm sure all of you have these long list of features and needs that you have for your existing systems, and I'm sure most of you have noticed over time it takes longer and longer to actually get these accomplished. What's great about Folio, because it is based on microservices, it's really designed from the start um, to have irreplaceable parts. And so if a piece needs to be updated, it can be pulled out, replaced. Um, if completely new features need to be added, they can almost be added at will as long as the code is built. But this can all happen without breaking what's there, which is really quite amazing. And so for example, if you're not happy with a cataloging app that came with Folio, you should be able to choose another one. And in fact, you will be able to choose another one very soon. In addition, uh, Folio is built around this idea of a vibrant ecosystem, right? Very similar, or it really takes into account the two bullet points above. Um, Folio is a platform. And so I think the best analogy, for instance, is your smartphone. Uh, when Apple rolled out that platform, they actually rolled it out with a series of some very basic sets of functionality. And really, the market, individuals, companies, um, uh, really anyone out there started building applications for it because they could. The platform was available for everyone to work with. 
Folio is very much the same way. Uh, we've got no illusions, of course. The library automation market is nowhere near the size of the smartphone market, but we already see this happening today where either individuals, other companies, or libraries are starting to step forward and make pieces and tools of functionality available for the Folio platform. So when we look at Folio from a feature perspective, there's advantages as well. Um, Folio has really been designed from the start to support additional feature metadata, excuse me, additional metadata formats easily without forcing a rewrite. Um, so for instance, right now, we're obviously focusing on Mark because right now it's the most prevalent, but fairly soon afterwards, whether it be Dublin Core, some variant of BibFrame or Meds, Mods, whatever, um, is all that's really needed is an import tool, um, a mapping, and the ability to edit. And once those pieces are added, um, essentially we're done. And what's great about this is none of the other folio applications need to be rewritten or recreated to support those other data, metadata formats. And in fact, they don't even need to know those other metadata formats exist because of the way folio abstracts all that out in a native format. Folio was also designed to support multiple knowledge bases simultaneously. Um, we do not believe this idea of a library forced to focus and work with a single knowledge base is really rational because different knowledge bases tend to have different strengths. And depending on your library's needs, you may need to choose one or another or possibly choose multiple knowledge bases and operate with them simultaneously. Folio has that ability. In addition, something that helps sort of tie this all together, Folio, um, as far as I know, is the only system that provides a complete view of the content that your library can make available. Um, it can pull in, or rather someone can conduct a search, and they can gather results from not just the local catalog, but really any other content that's selected, organized, or in some way managed using external systems, using these external knowledge bases. And so when faculty or staff or someone comes up to you in the library and wants to know anything really about a particular piece of content, do we have it, or I swear we used to have it, what happened, there's actually the single place where a library can go to search and see what they have, what they don't have, and actually also see where they can possibly get it if they don't have it as well. So Folio, um, in terms of how it's moving along according to its development plan that we put in place for actually quite a while ago, um, right now um, at the end of Q2, um, we just did um, or conducted a fairly major release. Um, I will show you that and that functionality. Um, our goal is really to aim for a first adopter, um, first of the early adopters in Q1 of 2019. Um, again, um, this is software development. We're trying to project in the future. This is as best as we can estimate. And then ideally for the summer of 2019, um, we have a group of early adopter libraries that attend, intend to adopt as well. And so, We've used this information, of course, to help feed um, our process in terms of priorities and what we need to get done and what the development teams working on Folio need to focus on. So let me stop real quick. And let me... Um, here we go. Okay, can everyone see my browser? Yes, excellent. All right. So in terms of our uh, process, um, in terms of how we gain our priorities, how we set up our roadmap, timelines, so on. Um, we've got a group of core libraries that we work with, and one of those groups represent what we call the Product Council, and the Product Council is really responsible for helping provi provide direction for the overall project. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is um, fairly simple. It's a survey. And so in this case, one of the, uh, this is a perfect example where we have in JIRA, 
um, a reasonably sized set of epics, epics meaning large projects that we know we need to work on. And uh, what we do is we send out a survey and the libraries that are involved in the project can come back and basically tell us where their highest priorities are in terms of Folio as a project. And then we're able to take this data and this data helps organize really the large feature sets, details and stories that we focus on as well. And those stories and features do exist in JIRA, which is available to anyone who wants to see. But what we also have done is because we do have this group of early adopters that expect to go live during the summer, we're able to take all those features and actually do yet another survey and try to understand what are the key requirements for these libraries that intend to go live. What are the features they absolutely need to have to go live during the summer? Which are the ones that maybe they can wait a quarter, six months, or possibly a year later? And so they work diligently. Um, this is not easy. There's an enormous amount of information here, but they've been able to go through and help us prioritize, or at least help us understand what's critical. And you can see here, we actually have the ID numbers, which exist as links, that actually will take you into JIRA to show you the description of that particular feature. And then we're able to take all of that. Um, just a minute. and build out um, what we would call a capacity plan. And so we're able to prioritize, we're able to take all those features that were absolutely required by those early adopters and then some, and we're able to map this out um, against all the different development teams that are involved in the project, the number of people and the um, hours or actually days worth of work that they have available to work on this project. And on top of that, we're able to add to this all the estimates that the developers have actually made based on what they believe is required to build all those features as well. And so we end up with a document that looks pretty much like this. In fact, this is the document. And it's kind of interesting because everything in green here is actually what we expect to get done in the current quarter. This isn't necessarily in any um, major order. As you can see, the colors sort of um, bounce around throughout the document. And then everything that's in yellow is what we believe will get accomplished in the final quarter of the year. And everything in red doesn't mean anything alarming or bad. What it actually means is these are the things that we'll be working on and planning at the start of 2019 as well. And um, this spreadsheet allows us to make decisions as to, for instance, uh, we know we have a feature that absolutely positively has to get done. Um, it has to be, get done in a particular time frame. It doesn't look like we have maybe the developers or the team on hand to take to actually work on it. And so what happens if we start to arrange or rearrange and adjust some of the projects we expect to happen next? What does it look like? How does it affect our roadmap? What can we inspect? What can we expect in terms of timing? Um, it's also important because we get the community library, the library community actually coming in and saying, great, we love Folio, but we believe in what this is. We've got some developers or a product owner that we'd like to apply to the project to help this get done quicker. And so, you know, we've always got this issue of there's a new developer coming on what should we put them on? What's the next highest priority feature set that this team of developers can work on? And this is what this helps us provide as well. No questions? I think we're good. No questions so far. All right. So what I'm going to do is just a moment here. I am going to provide a brief demonstration. Uh, whoops. One moment. Just a second, I lost my web browser.
All right. Do you see the future of libraries is open? Yes. Excellent. All right. All right, so this is um, the latest version of Folio um, that was just released in the last quarter. Um, keep in mind, uh, this is a work in progress. <laughs> there are issues here and there. And uh, sometimes I find, of course, as developers are updating, um, sometimes a few changes have appeared. So there might be a few surprises, but I should be able to show you pretty much the majority of the functionality that exists, at least for right now. Um, I've logged in, um, I've actually logged in using SSO Shibboleth. And um, once I have, I happen to be a user that has rights within the system. So I can take advantage of all these different apps. Um, but here we've got the ability to manage users. Um, I can filter by tic particular user sets. Um, I can search at will. Um, so if I search for me, um, this is me within the system. Um, as I click, of course, on any particular user, the rightmost pane appears, which shows me the details about this user. Um, we've got this UI feature um, that uh, we refer to as an accordion. And um, this accordion can be um, expanded fully or collapse fully. Um, folks can choose to expand any particular part of this accordion as they choose to do so. Um, we can also go in and edit a user here as needed. Um, I can, for example, um, change the barcode. Um, I can go through. Um, Folio has the ability to support proxies. And so, for example, um, uh, I can set myself up as a proxy for any particular person. Um, um, I can also be a sponsor as well. And um, actually, let me just choose someone here. And um, with these, of course, I can set expiration dates. Is the relationship currently active or not? Um, who actually gets notifications if something is overdue? Um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time dealing with that right now. So let me uh, remove these two. However, I did change the barcode, and I do want that change to stick. And so I'm going to go through and update the user. Um, it also happens to be a barcode that I can remember, which will be nice a little bit later in the demonstration. Um, at any time, um, you can attach notes to any particular person where these can be added, modified, and uh, changed at will. Um, and that's really, for the most part, um, what is patron management. Um, one other piece that might be interesting here is I can take a look um, at any current transactions. It does give me a count. Um, and so in this case, I want to look at any closed loans that exist for this person. Um, in this case, I don't have any open loans, but if I did, they'd appear there as well. And here we can see um, a lot of the user permissions that have been assigned to this particular person as well. Um, actually, let me leave that up. And then I can go through and manage inventory. Inventory is really uh, the analogy or really what one would consider the traditional catalog in many cases. There are some additional interesting features. As I mentioned, it can be um, enhanced or advanced with additional metadata formats in the future. Um, but right now, what we're looking at is actually um, Folio's native default format. And we can also um, jump off and take a look at the mark data as well. We've got all the traditional filtering, um, whether it be material types, language, locations that you would expect. Um, we can click on these and get the details. Um, I can search. Um, I can get. Um, I can take a look at the details, as I mentioned earlier. Um, here, um, I can take a look at the actual um, items and holdings. I can add items and holdings as are needed. 
Um, this feature here gives me the option to duplicate a record in case I just need to make a copy, for example, of an item that I just need to make a minor change to, to add additional copy to make it as quick as possible. I've got the notes feature I showed you earlier. And then here as well, I can go in and edit. And at this point, we are editing what is the native record format for Folio. Um, I'm not really going to make any changes. Um, I'm not a cataloger, and uh, this is not something um, I see myself being good at. So I will exit that. Um, that said, actually, one thing. Let me go back here and get this barcode, because I'll use it later. And uh, that's it, really, for items and holdings that exist in inventory. Um, if I need to, of course, um, I can check out and I'll use my barcode here. And this is the basic borrow information that appears. This can be modified, of course. Um, and I'm also going to add the barcode of the item that I just looked at earlier. And now this item is on loan. And of course, I can go through and scan a whole series of barcodes here. And when I'm done, I can choose to end the session and clear this. Um, everything is really working in real time here. So if I go back here now and um, take a look at this same user, um, I now have a one here for loans, which is showing me my active loans, and I now have an open loan. And again, I can click in, take a look at it, and where before this is blank, I now have something. Um, I can also go in and take a look at inventory. And um, uh, uh, one moment. Here I can see the status is checked out as well, because this is the book, obviously, I just checked out. Um, I can go through and check in. And again, I can enter in that barcode to return the item. Um, I can also, right here and now, make a change um, in terms of how I choose to process this. Um, I may need to backdate this, if possible. Um, I may need to set a time. Um, this is especially useful if there's a book drop or something like that, or we've just got a pile of books we haven't been able to get to. Um, we don't want to issue fines or fees to a person because they probably really did return it on time. And we can return that item as well. And so this item is now returned. Um, I can also go in here and um, take a look at patron details or, for instance, any more, uh, more details about the loan if I choose to or need to. Right here, I can choose to renew or change the due date as well. We have a request feature. And um, although I don't have a lot of requests in the system, this really represents holes, recalls, and pages. And so I do have the ability to search or filter, um, especially I have a large number of these. I can take a look at the holes. Um, I can go through and uh, create a new one by entering in um, uh, a barcode. I think that was the one I entered in before. And I can to enter in a requester. And, and so in this particular case, I now have a hold on this item. Um, I can set up a preference in terms of pickup location or um, whatever is needed. I'm going to close without saving this. Um, I think that's about it. That really applies pretty much across the board as far as holes, recalls, and pages. Um, there is an open question. Um, what methods can be used to load patron data? Um, right now, there is um, a, a utility um, at this point in time, actually a command line utility that can either be run uh, manually or can be set up in batch um, where um, records that are um, delimited can be selected, loaded, and learned in, and um, loaded into the system. Um, uh, there is some uh, basic mapping functionality that exists in there as well, um, but that's also an area of ongoing development, and um, these are areas which are getting more and more features daily. I can um, go in. One of the things I mentioned um, was this idea of a codex search, and I can do a search. And um, uh, whoops. 
And this shows me uh, the results of everything that exists in the collection relating to folio. Now, um, this terminology most likely, at least I think, will be changing where it says local. Right now, this actually represents what exists in the local catalog or inventory. Um, however, this is also showing us what it was able to determine based on a knowledge base that is set up and configured for Folio to operate as well. So this is where um, we would manage our packages, in this case, for example, that we as a library subscribe to as well. And I can go in and, for instance, click on one of these, and it will show me the details of this particular item. Um, I can also go back, for example, and click on let's say 5,000 years of geometry, and it will show me the title. Um, I can see what packages this title is available as well. And um, let me go back here to Codex Search. And of course, I've got a whole series of filters here to help me really narrow in and focus the th on the things that I need to find. If I am really only interested in what's in my local catalog, I can select that as well, um, or my knowledge base as well. Um, one of the things I just sort of popped into um, was e-holdings, and this is actually a direct tie-in to an external knowledge base. Um, and so, for instance, I can go in here, um, I can search for providers, and if I conduct a search, here I find in this particular case ProQuest Info and Learning. Um, I can see I have 15 out of 918 packages. Um, if I click on that, um, I actually get a list of the different packages that ProQuest makes available. Um, I can, for instance, select on ABI Inform. Um, and once I take a look at ABI Inform, here I can get more details. Um, I can see the total number of titles. This happens to be a package that is selected, meaning I actually subscribe to it. Um, this also communicates with the external knowledge base in this particular case because this vendor um, needs to have that information as well for link resolution and so on. Um, I've got different settings here that I can modify. Is this visible to patrons or not? Um, does this um, package automatically update when new titles are added? Um, I can go in and edit this, and this is where I can start to change some of these features where I can adjust coverage dates and so on. Uh, I can also go in and um, search for package. And so if I am looking for academic search complete, um, I can click on this and very much as you saw earlier, I get the basic details about the package. Again, see here, I see this is something I actually subscribe to. And I can again edit and adjust the same information you saw previously. Um, I can also go in here, for example, and um, search for titles. Um, geometry is getting boring. Let's try something else here. And so if I am interested in, um, I guess, centering fundamentals, um, I can select it. In this case, it's, it's a book um, that is available electronically. And again, here I can see some basic information, the title. Um, I can see the packages that it's part of. Um, I can also add this to a custom package if that in particular is the way I choose to maybe manage a set of separate titles. Um, and I can do that here where I can select a particular package, which I'm not gonna do right now. Um, I can also go in and um, here we see some of the beginnings of acquisitions. Um, there's actually more to acquisitions, although at the moment in this particular demo, I only have vendors. Um, but for instance, I don't know, it's pretty basic, state, straightforward. I can select a vendor, I can go through, and um, I can see the details about this particular vendor. Um, my, well, my contact information, any phone numbers, email addresses, URLs, um, people that I might use to contact, language information, so on. 
any agreements I might have in place, any additional vendor information. Um, if I happen to work with this vendor with EDI, I can set up the details here as well, um, as well as any general accounts information and interface as well. Um, there are a couple other questions. Um, someone asked, am I searching the EBSCO knowledge base? And in this case, I am. Um, however, um, there is um, right now an additional knowledge base um, that is in progress, and that one is GoKB. And we expect relatively soon some additional commercial knowledge bases available as well. Um, Let's see, Heather's asking, um, is there no distinction between a book and an ebook? So other than some fields and the ability to filter, for example, on um, books and ebooks, um, we've actually tried relatively hard within Folio to sort of blur the distinction, meaning Folio should be good at managing all your content, whether it's electronic, whether it's print, whether it's a package, a journal, or a monograph. Um, and so there is just you know, some basic metadata type differences, but in general, overall, things tend to work the same way. And um, can loan history be archived? Um, loan history can be archived, although at this very moment, there isn't exactly an archive feature. Um, that's something we expect to see in the future. Um, however, that history um, right now can really um, accumulate for as long as any library wants. And, and you know, ideally at least that should suit um, what might be an archive, although not maybe a traditional archive where someone may wanna make a copy of this and store this elsewhere. Uh, real quick, um, settings and configuration of Folio assuming a user has the rights to do this. Um, one can go in and set up, for instance, opening periods, um, hours of operation for the library. Um, we can create as many of these as we like and configure as many of these as we like for different periods or different times of the year. Um, within circulation, um, basic loan policies and well, here's an example of a loan policy that can be set up, configured. And again, it follows really that same design pattern that we see everywhere. So if I need to edit it, I can change that here. Um, here I can set up um, fixed due dates for different parts of the year. Um, so for instance, maybe at year end, um, I can config configure this. I can go in and again, add as many as I choose to do so. Um, there's some basic settings of the system, what we wanna use for um, patron IDs in terms of checking out whether we want audio alerts or not. And then here's a timeout for the circulation screen after a particular time of inactivity, should it clear the screen and when. Um, here we've got the ability to, um, to work with staff slips and uh, this is currently an area in progress, but for instance, here we have the basic template where we can go in and set up the notification that we want to send out. And here we see sort of the, really the macros representing the data elements that we want to have in here. And so, you know, we might want to do something like, um, hello, so-and-so, um, please do something. And, um, and then here we have the ability to preview what that might look like. Um, you see the barcode, by the way, show up in the preview um, because we do have barcode here listed as something that we want to display. Um, if we don't want it to appear, we can get rid of it as well. I'm not going to save and close this. I'm going to skip the developer options because, well, it's for developers. Um, here, in this case, for e-holdings, since we are connecting to a knowledge base, it would typically require a key. Um, as other knowledge bases start to be, be added, um, we would expect to see those listed here as well. And the assumption is there probably be additional keys to connect via their APIs. Um, for inventory here, um, we can set up and configure different loan types. Um, here's where we can set up material types as well, where we can add, modify, and delete these. Um, for instances themselves, um, which really represent the titles, um, we can set up uh, contributor types, um, formats, 
and resource types as well, which can all be modified and edited. Um, in addition, um, we're here, um, we can select uh, the language, the default language of the system and time zone. Um, Folio and its user interface are designed to be localized. Um, we here is where we set up and configure SSO, single sign-on, SAML or Shibboleth authentication. Um, and here's where we're actually able to set up service points within the library. I can create as many as needed. I can edit existing ones as well. We can set up and configure the institutions, um, create as many as we need to. We can set up uh, campuses um, for a particular institution. Um, we can set up libraries as well for a particular institution on a particular campus. And um, we can set up locations as well that can be used. Um, some basic configuration um, for uh, users. Um, we can set up as many address types as we like. We can set up as many patron groups as we like. Um, uh, we can set up uh, permission sets as well and um, profile pictures, which actually isn't functional at this point in time. One quick thing, um, I had mentioned earlier that Folio is based on this concept of a microservice architecture. Um, this is not something that a typical person would use on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, here we're actually able to go in and take a look. And in this case, we've got 42 services that are representing the features and functionality that you saw here today. And um, all of these pieces can actually be replaced pretty much at will as needed and uh, without really causing the entire system to fall down, break, or anything like that. And they can be replaced because they just need to be updated with a newer version, but they could also be replaced because maybe you've got a completely different option you'd like to replace it with. And um, so for instance, if you're not happy with the institutional calendar here, um, you can hopefully at some point in time choose one that was created by someone else, or you can actually work with um, a vendor and maybe hire someone to build one that suits your need. And ideally you can make that available to the open source community. Um, or if need be, if you have the staff, the people, or you know, the students on hand, they can build one for you as well. So um, Danielle um, asked a question, for creating institutions, you note that you can add as many as you need to. Is this how group shared library systems are um, instituted and managed? Um, it is, there's however, two concepts within Folio. Folio, one other, um, I guess, added benefit it has as a platform, it's really been designed from the ground up as a multi-tenant system. And so we've actually got two ways to deal with um, multi-library organizations. One of them is much more like a traditional union catalog where you have a single instance um, um, or let's say a single tenant where all the libraries tend to be merged in and all get their particular views of the data that exists within the system. And then the other one is really based on tenants where it's a single folio system that's running, but each of the libraries exist as a single tenant. Um, there aren't a lot of tools that exist right now for cross-tenant functionality, but those are currently planning and those are going to be built. So ideally giving the ability to move data between the different tenants as they're needed. And um, let's see here, one other thing I think I'd like to share. So Folio itself um, does not provide discovery functionality. Um, the focus of Folio is really running the library. Um, the whole premise for Folio was also Every library should choose the discovery service that best meets their needs. We don't believe that all libraries should standardize on a single discovery service. And then on top of it, there are many libraries that frankly choose to build their own discovery interfaces as well. So this again is work that's not yet complete provide a quick little demo here. Um, this happens to be EDS. Um, it's obviously one I'm familiar with, um, but just for clarity's sake, uh, to make sure people understand, 
currently there's actually ongoing work for viewfind as well and i do expect that sometime relatively soon we would see blacklight and then ideally folio is an open source platform there's absolutely no reason why other vendors can't step forward and provide their discovery solutions as well and as far as we can tell we expect them to do so um, because many of the libraries that are working on this project have um, different ideas and different needs as far as the discovery service that they would like to choose so just real quick here uh, begin a new session I timed out uh, one moment here Okay, so this should work. So if I do a search for Hobbit. So I've done a search. Um, please keep in mind this is running quite literally on a software developer's machine. So, you know, performance is not representative of um, what you can expect. But here I've done a search and this query has happened on a really um, the full collection that exists for a particular library. This is mainly test data. So, you know, it's not beautiful. It doesn't have all the fields it's supposed to have. Um, but here we can see I've done a search. Um, I see the title author. Um, I can go through and I can see the copies that are available and the call numbers. And this all came live straight out of Folio. Um, if I am to actually sign in, and please excuse this crude identity uh, provider, but this is um, sort of a, a generic shibboleth identity provider that we've set up for test purposes. And let me log in here. And then, um, I'll log in. And my view will change a bit because now that it knows who I am, and um, in addition to showing availability, if I look up here, I can see the number of checkouts that I actually have. Um, I can click on that. And here, this is showing the actual items that I have checked out as reported by the Folio system. Um, I can also go through and we have renewal functionality working. So if I need to, I can go directly, directly into the system and renew. Um, all of this functionality is available to other discovery services as well. Um, so this is something that Viewfind can use um, or any other system that needs to. And to be honest, if these other systems choose to not use this particular API, they're actually free to build one of their own that works best for them as well. Um, you can see here, I have some fees that have accumulated. I'm not going to show you that because work is not complete. And if I click on it, we end up with a blank page. But um, that's essentially it for demonstration. Let me stop sharing. happened. Wait. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. But it's not it's not open it's just uh power sure is open. Yeah. are you seeing presenter mode or are you seeing the actual slide i'm seeing the slide now <laughs> okay good all right so we did the demonstration and so just real quick to give you an idea of the growth of this project um, Folio was actually started in 2016 where there's some uh, um, early and really key construction 
on the platform itself, which is Okapi, the core communications layer. This is where the microservices essentially connect and plug into. And also Stripes, which is our common user interface toolkit. Um, we just saw Folio running as a whole series of microservices. They collectively provided a common view that looked like it was created by the same team. In reality, Folio is being built by many different teams. And so this chart shows the growth um, of developers that have been contributed by um, really um, organizations that were included in part of this project from the beginning, as well as new ones that have entered a little bit later at different points in time. And um, right now, um, yeah, we're right around um, the 60 to 70 um, developers that are actually working on this. This does not include, for instance, the product owners that work with the development teams. This does not work the absolutely critical SIGs that we work with that represent the groups of libraries that spend enormous amount of time with us trying to help us understand what their requirements are so POs and others can turn these into requirements and features that the developers build. And we're expecting additional developers to join as well. And so as we look at, as we're heading into the end of the year, we expect that number to actually climb to over 70 as well, which is exciting because as we get more and more teams, we're actually able to get more and more work done in parallel. And if you remember a little earlier, I did show you that um, capacity plan and we're able to apply these and ideally more and more of those projects become green and yellow, um, moving from red. And um, that's it for Folio. Any other questions? Well, do we want to run through the questions that we got answered in Q&A, but for the benefit of those who may not be at the computer? Sure. Okay, so let's see. So I think when you were running through the demo site, somebody asked about when you were in the inventory app, they asked if that's where cataloging would be done. So um, cataloging is done. Um, however, um, there's, I guess maybe what I should be calling record editing, which is what I showed you, which is really dealing with the default format that Folio uses internally if you choose to do so. And I wasn't able to demonstrate it, but there's actually a full blown cataloging app that's being built and integrated as well, which allows you to go to the source record and actually work in Mark. And once you save those changes in Mark, um, not only of course is the record, the Mark record updated in Folio, but the more um, abstract or generic record that all the Folio apps use are updated as well. So you actually have a choice in terms of where you choose to operate. Somebody asked whether Folio allows for a single installation for multiple libraries. It does allow for a single installation for multiple libraries. And there's two ways to deal with it. One of them quite literally where the libraries tend to almost merge in union form, um, where they become um, almost a single large library. And the other one where in a single Folio um, install, they exist as separate tenants within Folio, where by default, they don't necessarily share any information at all. And then somebody asked if there's gonna be an update to the timeline on the Folio Wiki. There is. Um, we've been going through a lot of work in terms of updating the capacity plans and the priorities for the project. Um, we're getting close to that point in time now where we've got a lot of really good and updated information and we'll be going back to update that timeline shortly. Roadmap, excuse me. Okay, and let me see. Somebody on Twitter asked about the recording and I, I misspoke earlier. Um, it, it's not gonna be on the Olay site because the Olay site's recently recently been updated um, and the there's gonna be a new Folio website rolling out next month. And so for the time being, uh, the recording will be can be found on the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. And so I'm gonna put that URL in chat. And then a couple of people have asked about 
being able to access the demo. And so I'm going to put a link to the demo that's hosted by the by GBV. And and it will prompt you for a username and password and so I've put those in the chat as well. Any other questions? I think we're caught up at the moment. All right. So uh, this concludes today's Folio Forum. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, uh, and on the Twitter on the Twitter, <laughs> on Twitter, using the hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, the recording of today's forum, as I mentioned, will be available through the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. Um, it, that URL is in the, in the chat box, but you can also just go to YouTube and search for Open Library Foundation. Uh, if you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum is scheduled for August 15th and it will be on the topic of some of the resource access apps. Thank you to Harry and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Thank, Thank you. you everyone.